Hello and welcome to Verso Live, a new virtual event program to celebrate 50 years of Verso books. All events are streamed live and will be available to watch again after the event has finished via our YouTube channel. Questions and comments can be made via the YouTube chat box. We hope you enjoy the event. Hi, and good evening. My name is Anne Pettifor, and I'm published with Verso. I've uh, written The Case for the Green New Deal. I'm the author of The Case for the Green New Deal. I'm delighted this evening to be um, chairing an event with the Care Collective, a group of um, academics um, and activists who've produced this excellent manifesto, the Care Manifesto. Uh, which I strongly recommend you get a copy of from Verso. Um, so we're going to begin by introducing the speakers. Uh, I'm chairing the event, but I'm really here just like you to listen to the contributions of these fine people and find out more about the collective and the care manifesto. So if we can begin with um, uh, Lynn Siegel, who's one of the co-authors of the Care Manifesto. Lynn, hi. Um, hello, welcome. Anne. Hello, and just introduce yourself, please. Hello, Anne. Yes, it's lovely to be here. I'm also a verse author, but uh, I'm an aging second wave feminist, and I've written a lot about that, about um, feminism and belonging and politics, most recently on ageing and also now attachments to others on moments of radical happiness. But I've always been worried about the individualism of our times and the lack of care and concern for others, which has been so much um, encouraged just in terms of self-emancipation and um, and autonomy rather than thinking of how we're embedded in society. So that's what led me to think about care and the carelessness of our times. And uh, that's why I joined the Care Collective. In fact, I think it was formed to support me because I was wanting already to write about care. Fabulous. Thank you very much, Lynn. So really, so this is about the politics of interdependence. And um, it's so relevant. It's so relevant to this moment, this this COVID moment. So let me call now on Jamie Hakim, uh, who's another co-author and another member of the collective. Yeah, thank you, Anne. So um, my name is Jamie Hakim. I'm a lecturer in media studies at the University of East Anglia. And I uh, am currently working on a project that looks at the politics of intimacy. And so it was and kind of rethinking intimacy and what intimacy means to kind of different groups of people. Um, and it was really the overlap with care um, and intimacy that kind of brought me into this, into the collective. And, and it's that way, uh, those are the sorts of issues that I've written about in the, in the, in the book with the, with the others. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Um, wow. Uh, can I now call Joe Littler? Because Joe is another one of the co members of this collective. Hi there. Thanks, Anne. Um, yes, I work at City uh, University in London in the sociology department and the Gender and Sexualities Research Centre. Um, I'm interested broadly in like, so, um, society, culture and power and inequality. I've written about meritocracy, so I got very interested in how we, we incited to work hard, activate our talent and rise to the top of the social pile and how those narratives are all about individualism and self-care. So I became very interested in how we're incited constantly to look after ourselves, but not think about collective care in the same way. Thank you so much, Joe. Now I want to call on um, Andreas Hatsidakis. Uh, hello. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, I'm Andreas Kutakis. I'm a professor of marketing and consumer ethics at the uh, Royal Holloway University of London. And um, since my early PhD days, a uh, central theme in my work has been why consumers and people more generally don't care or why perhaps they do care, but they fail to act on their specific concerns about other people and the planet. And I have engaged with various disciplines in my work from sociology of deviance to psychoanalysis. But um, um, 
being a member of a care collective has been an eye-opening experience for me, literally, both in terms of um, extending um, the concept of care. Previously, I had only engaged with uh, the idea of care ethics, uh, but also politicizing it and uh, acknowledging its uh, complexities, which we talk about in our book. Thank you, Andreas. Now, finally, I'd like to call on um, Catherine Rottenberg, who's going to both introduce herself, I hope, but also tell us a little bit more about the collective. So first, I want to thank uh, you, Anne, and thank the collective and thank the audience who we can't see, which is still very strange after six months of Zoom. Um, so I'm Catherine Rottenberg. I am an associate professor um, in the Department of American and Canadian Studies at the University of Nottingham. Um, my most recent um, academic book is uh, The Rise of Neoliberal Feminism. Um, and my work has always been informed by feminist theory. Um, I've been a feminist activist for a long time and I've been involved in various social justice movements over the past few decades. Um, but I wanna also just say a little bit about the Care Collective and how it was created and what what our motivation was for writing the manifesto. Um, so basically, as Anne introduced us, um, the Care Collective was created as a reading group um, in the fall of 2017. A bunch of academics who are also activists in various social justice movements. We really came together um, in part because we wanted to support Lynn, but we also wanted to think about the notion of care from different perspectives. Um, we wanted really to try to make sense of what we saw as the multiple crises of care already engulfing our, our world, um, the rising inequality everywhere, endless war, the refugee crisis, and of course, looming over everything, ongoing, ongoing climate change and imminent environmental catastrophe. And so after meeting for almost two years, reading, discussing, debating, disagreeing, um, we finally decided to write the CARE Manifesto, the of interdependence, which um, has come out. And again, one of the motivations for writing the, ma the manifesto was to outline a collaborative vision of what an alternative world with care at the center could look like. Um, what I think we're, we're too used to dystopic visions of the future, and we really wanted to imagine a progressive and utopian one together. Um, and of course, as we began writing, we could never have anticipated how grimly urgent COVID would make our manifesto. Um, and so I'm just going to say a few words about the manifesto, um, and then I will uh, give the stage back to Anne. In the manifesto, what we do is we argue um, that the current global crisis is indeed a crisis of care. It's the result of decades of policies prioritizing profit over people and the reduction of more and more domains of our lives to a market logic. So we've seen years of austerity measures, we've seen years of intensified deregulation and privatization, and that's gone alongside the devaluing of care practices and care work, which in large part has to do with the devaluing of care practices and care work has to, has to do with, its, with their historical association with women and women's work and the so-called unproductive domestic realm. And what's that, what that's meant is that neoliberal nation states and particularly countries like the UK and the US have been utterly unable and even unwilling to cope swiftly or effectively with the spread of coronavirus. So governments which have been, which have for too long based their policies and needs of the few on the ever increasingly wealthy one billionaire class and have based on economic growth have really failed to respond adequately to the pan pandemic. So in the manifesto, what we what we argue is that a politics of carelessness has reigned. Um, and I think this has manifested itself really clearly in the UK over the past six months. Um, the UK has had the highest number of confirmed corona virus deaths in Europe due to the government's multiple forms of carelessness. We know that the government refused to take heed um, of warnings about future pandemics following SARS and MERS. Um, the UK had already slashed hospital resources, including the number of nurses and hospital beds, um, nor did it respond to coordinated EU strategies to no protective equipment. And meanwhile, care homes were to a large extent uh, abandoned. Almost 20,000 elderly residents in care homes died of COVID-19 in the first nine, uh, three months of the virus. And again, today we see uh, warnings happen again. 
So in other words, the COVID-19 pandemic has dramatically and horrifically exposed this utter lack, lack of care. And yet, and this is what we try and talk about in the manifesto, the, the, uh, the pandemic has also exposed our profound interdependence. It has in so many ways highlighted our shared vulnerability and that the need for care is part and parcel of the human condition. So on the one hand, COVID has laid bare the violence and the devastation perpetuated by neoliberal markets, as well as the profound falsehood of neoliberalism's ideal subject, that self-sufficient and entrepreneurial autonomous individual. On the other hand, it has reignited a conversation about care. So when we think about essential workers, not just doctors and nurses and care home workers, but bus and tube drivers, supermarket workers, and garbage collectors, all of those without whose labor society simply cannot function. All of a sudden, these workers were, were rendered visible, showered with public appreciation, and touted as heroes during the UK's period of lockdown. So if the pandemic has taught us anything so far, it's that we are in urgent need of a radically new politics that puts care front and center. And this new politics, this new radical politics of care, has to be one that doesn't just talk the talk, doesn't just lionize essential workers while refusing to raise their salaries or improve their, their working conditions, but one that also walks the walk. So I'm, I'm going to conclude just by saying um, that in the CARE Manifesto, we argue that we need to expand our understanding and politics of care. Care cannot be understood only as the hands-on care people do when directly looking after the physical and emotional needs of others. Rather, the vision that we offer in the manifesto is one that advances a model of universal care, where care is understood as an enduring social capacity and practice involving the nurturing of all that is necessary for the welfare and flourishing of human and non-human life. So care is our individual and common ability to provide the political, social, material and emotional conditions that allow for the greatest possible number of people and living creatures on this planet, along with the planet itself, to thrive. So that was a very long answer. Um, and Anne. No, no, I, it was very, very good and very comprehensive. And I can't tell you how welcome it is to be talking about the politics of care. But having said that, we've already had a question from one of our viewers who asks, do you have any healthcare professionals in the group? And if not, was that a reason for it? I mean, I gather your picture is bigger. Your picture is that, you know, it's not just about the healthcare professionals. It's about economics and society. Is that right? Yes, Catherine? Yes, that's right. <laughs> yes, I mean, it. first, it, um, we did not have health professionals in the group. Um, and the manifesto is basically um, an outline, a utopian and progressive vision of an alter alternative uh, world in which care is front and center. It's the organizing principle. Um, but I'm going to let my, my the care collective, the other participants, talk about the different sections, which will help answer the question, I think. Thank you so much, Catherine. And I can't agree more. Um... And I want. I hope at the end we'll talk a bit about the Green New Deal. So, um, can I go to Lynn and ask you, Lynn, um, why do you think caring work is undervalued? And and you speak in particular. You use a phrase, the disavowals of dependency. Um, what do you mean by that? What can you say more about it? Yes. Um, uh, thanks for that uh, outline, Catherine. Very clear. I thought. Now, I'll get to the disavowals of dependency because, in fact, it connects with all of the reasons why care has been undervalued, both historically and still today. Because it's far from the first time that people have called to embed care at the heart of politics. Indeed, feminists have always made that call. They've made that call because for so long we know this has been the work that women have shouldered primarily. So there's our first problem. Care is seen as the work women do, or at least what we've been seen, what's been seen as our role, which traditionally went unpaid and indeed was barely thought of even as work. So that connects with why it was 
marginalized and also seen as unproductive. And even on the left, real politics has always tended to prioritize jobs and not caring jobs, but jobs and what's seen as most profitable for the economy, what's most immediately linked to profits. So that's what we feel we have to turn around. For we know, like feminists before us, that the, uh, the economy actually completely relies upon the work of care and all that enables us to part, survive and, fl and flourish and reproduce ourselves. That is, care is an essential part of the economy. But care has always been gendered with most households, though, now dependent upon two incomes from women and men, what we've seen is the development of a huge care deficit, one currently met by a whole global care chain, often moving from poorer countries to richer countries, so that it's predominantly now poor immigrant and non-white women who perform much of our caring work. Thus, racism today combines with gender and global inequality to devalue what's so socially and personally most needed by all of us. And care work is also undervalued, indeed often repudiated, and this is where I get to the disavowal of dependency, because of the continuing contempt and devaluation for so-called dependency. Manhood, for instance, has always been symbolized as the very antithesis of dependency. Now, you'd think this worn out gender creed might have disappeared long ago. But actually, for the last four decades, neoliberal exaltation of wholly misleading notions of individual resilience, autonomy, choice, and productivity has actually deepened disavowals of human fragility, human dependency, and all our shared needs for care. The ideal citizen today, male or female, is encouraged to be endlessly entrepreneurial and resilient. The mantra of self-sufficiency and the pathologizing of dependency help justify the dismantling of welfare benefits and resources all begun here under Margaret Thatcher, which is why we hear so much about benefit scroungers and other ways of insulting all those people in need of help from the state. And yet another reason for marginalizing caring work is that it's also often extremely challenging and work that's quite at odds with the pace of profitable commodity production. Indeed, the very concept of care overflows with paradoxes and ambivalence, often conflicting emotions, rarely their due respect and attention for attending fully to the needs of any living thing, and hence confronting vulnerability can be both difficult and also exhausting. So hands-on caring, however rewarding, however much we really want to be doing it, can also be daunting, bringing us into contact with our own and others' mortal embodied selves. So this is also why caring work has traditionally been relegated to the domain of women and servants, and somehow just for doing it, they've been deemed in theory inferior helping others disavow their own inescapable vulnerability and inevitable mortality which they really don't want to think about moreover the challenges of care and anxieties over doing it well even doing it adequately can even can easily fuel resentment in caring relationships especially, of course, given its cultural devaluation, even within that mythologized mother-child bond. And this is why feminist clinicians and other feminists, such as Rosie Parker, have stressed the inevitability of maternal ambivalence and the confused and contradictory emotions that actually mothers always have 
towards their children, but are expected to keep hidden. Thus, both positive and also negative emotions entwine with capabilities to care. And it's precisely because of this complexity and the challenges of care that we need to fight to ensure the necessary social infrastructures that can assist us in caring for others, whether near or far. Because we know that the pressures of today's job market routinely mean people barely have time to provide for the essential needs of their own dependents, let alone to pay heed to the situation of others. So more time and adequate material resources are simply essential to facilitate mutually fulfilling and imaginative practices of care at every level. Thus, far from public spending creating so-called pathologies of dependency, the reverse is true. Only with adequate and secure resources can anyone, whatever their needs, develop and maintain whatever capabilities they have to ensure some sense of autonomy and escape being rendered passive and helpless. This has been well illustrated by disability rights activists who argue for forms of independence in which some control over their lives is key precisely despite and because of their distinct needs for care, because of their recognition of their own dependencies. So we have to begin by jettisoning that destructive linking of dependency with pathology, accepting that we're all formed in different ways in and through our interdependencies. And that's what reimagining a caring politics entails alongside understanding those ambivalences that care can generate. It means fully valuing all the skills and resources necessary to promote care in all its manifestations. For we all need both to give and to receive care to sustain a sense of our common humanity and to co confront our own fears of human fr fragility and frailty rather than simply project them onto those we choose to label as dependent. Thanks. Gosh, Lynn, that was so mm -hmm. fine. Um, thank you very much for that. And it's so really interesting, given this particular moment. I, I, I live in a rural area, and I was very struck by the failure of our economy, of our institutions, to provide care but also by the willingness of the community to, to care. And it was sort of very basic and very fundamental um, and very spontaneous. Um, so, so it's in us all, but mm. you're quite right. The economics and the politics have actually insisted that we suppress that dependency. Um, and so this is... This is fascinating. Absolutely. Thank you very much. I, but I should stop chatting and move on. Um, I think the next person we have is is Jamie Hakim. And Jamie, you're going to talk to us about caring kinships and what you mean by, it. and I found this fascinating, promiscuous care. Can't hear you. We, can't hear you. we can't hear you. Sorry, I yeah, I just thought there was feedback. Anyway, um, so yeah, thank you, Anne. So the term promiscuous care came out of our thinking about care at the level of kinship, so personal, intimate, and familial relationships. So our current way of organising care at the level of kinship is insufficient in a number of ways. It overburdens mothers with childcare responsibilities, when middle-class mothers outsource these responsibilities, they tend to fall into the hands of hyper-exploited migrant women. And on a political level, we're not really encouraged to care for anyone beyond our families. This model of care, uh, we argue, has led in part to the recent rise of right-wing populism, exemplified by that now famous image of Melania Trump visiting child refugee detention centers with the words, I really don't care, literally painted on the back of her jacket. 
So we began to look to different times and places for alternative models of care that might replace those that prevail today. And we discussed these different models at length in the manifesto. One of these models comes out of AIDS activism from the 1980s. Excuse me. There were debates at the time about the role that gay men's so-called promiscuity played in the transmission of HIV in the early days of the HIV AIDS epidemic. The activist and academic Douglas Crimp argued that despite common sense assumptions that the promiscuity of stonewall sexual cultures spread HIV, what these cultures actually meant for the epidemic was that gay men multiplied and experimented with sexual practices beyond the penetrative sex that was a major root of HIV transmission. In this regard, promiscuity, he argued, led to safer sex practices that were in fact saving lives and not ending them, as some at the time would have it. We then began to discuss bottom-up care initiatives during the early days of the epidemic from the likes of organizations like ACT UP, Buddies and the Terence Higgins Trust. These initiatives sprung up precisely because the neoliberal, neoconservative state, the market and the biological family failed so spectacularly at caring for people living with and eventually dying from AIDS, providing all sorts of hands-on care for those living with the virus, as well as demanding that society care about them. In this spirit, we might call the multiplication and experimentation of forms of care beyond the state, the market and the family, promiscuous care. We argue that at the level of kinship, we need to act in line with an ethics of promiscuous care, multiplying and experimenting with modes of caring for, about and with, beyond the shriveled forms of care that are currently hegemonic. And what this means in practical terms is that our common sense needs to change around who should be caring for who and with what resources. We must normalize an egalitarian model of care where everyone can care for everyone, not just hyper-exploited, feminized and racialized subjects. And that a radically democratic state must resource these experimental caring arrangements. Childcare, elderly care and palliative care to name just a few, must be taken seriously and not treated just as commodities for neoliberal capitalism. We must proliferate and expand our circles of care beyond our families and those designated as our fellow citizens. And if we're to stop the mounting refugee and environmental crises, we must reimagine the stranger and the non-human world as if they were kin. So for us, promiscuous care is really about the question of who we care for, and advocating for an ethics of promiscuous care is a first step in building the psychic infrastructure of a new society that has universal care at its heart. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Yeah, and sure are right about the campaigns around HIV AIDS, and in particular ACT UP, incredibly caring, far more caring than the institutions at the time. Um, so now I'd like to turn to Joe, Joe Littler, um, and ask you, Joe, given my experience of what happened here during the lockdown, what do caring communities look like? Okay, thank you. Um, well, they don't all look the same for a start. And in the book, we draw on a wide range of different examples, both past and present for inspiration. Uh, but they do tend to have certain features that together create what we might call or think of as social infrastructures of care. So they always involve shared resources, uh, which might and we think should include things like free public broadband, ubiquitous water fountains, and sharing not only books through public libraries, but things like kitchen hardware, garden tools and toys, all those kinds of equipment that people use once or twice a year or just for a short space of time. And there are plenty of small examples of these kind of libraries of things already in existence. Um, caring communities, we think, always involve shared space by creating more public and green space. 
cycle lanes, pedestrian and play streets, parks and community centres. And they also facilitate shared activities of mutual benefit, as in how, for example, the GLC, the Greater London Council of the 1980s, was so creative in democratising um, community media and arts and culture and creating festivals that were genuinely diverse as well as the newer forms of municipalism, radical municipalism from Preston to Mississippi to Barcelona, which are facilitating the rebirth of the high streets, co-ops and pushing for affordable housing as they offer models of what's sometimes called community wealth building and make international alliances, um, such as through the transnational gathering Villa Cities. And we might, like you said, and think also of the great mutual aid neighborhood projects that have sprung up during the pandemic. So local experiments we think are really important in creating caring communities, um, but also at the same time, so is scaling them up uh, for sustainability and size. So here we might think of how, for example, um, the women's liberation crashes of the 1970s ended up leading to kind of infrastructure of, of local nurseries. Or we might think of how the Tredegar Mutual Aid Society um, of the late 19th century led to the formation of the NHS. So to do this kind of work of scaling up uh, needs political engagement. It also needs resource. So here at the issue of reversing the cuts that have been accelerated by austerity politics um, since the you know, past decade in particular is crucial. Uh, in the UK, local government spending has been cut by over half during the past decade, in some areas more, and we've lost uh, 17,000 hospital beds in the NHS. So that needs reversing, obviously. In some places, in some countries, it's starting to be prompted by the pandemic. So Spain, for example, has nationalised its private hospitals. And it's also critically important that the resourcing, that resource is shared so that it's not just siphoned off to unaccountable private corporations, as we see happening now in England through Circo's test and trace system, as we see happening in the States through Donald Trump's huge donations to companies with COVID relief money, oil companies. So we think expanding the commons or what we collectively own in terms of space, resources and democratic engagement is really key to caring communities and it will involve insourcing instead of outsourcing. It involves reversing the privatisation of schools and hospitals, bringing back care homes into public ownership. And they've done this recently in parts of Canada and British Columbia, or creating cooperative systems of social care, um, like the famous Birdsoft system in the Netherlands, where instead of having multiple carers who come in for tailorist 15 minute bursts, um, uh, they have a dedicated group of people who work on a cooperative, sustained basis to provide um, so health and social, so social care in an integrated way. So that means that no one can profit from pain. It means that the work of hands-on caring is materially as well as symbolically valued through better pay and conditions. So in other words, we're, we're arguing to roll back neoliberalism in favour of universal basic services and a mixed economy of collective ownership and activities. Because doing all of this means that we're also extending people's ability to participate in the world and to deepen local democracy. It enables us to care more and to be cared for. So we think that's a rough template of how we can create caring communities and how we might really try to take back control in a sustainable and pleasurable way rather than a proto-fascistic disaster capitalist one. Thanks. Gosh, thank you very much, Joe. And today I listened to the um, Chancellor and the thing that really struck me in his uh, presentation to the House of Commons was the number £12 billion spent on test and trace so far. £12 billion. Mm -hmm. If that had gone to local government, who knows? what could have happened in my community so thank you for that um now um i think we now have andreas um andreas um you're going to look at care washing um and um tell us something about what is involved in a, a really caring economy um, as opposed to just i don't know treating it very superficially and as a commodity Right, yeah. So basically, I have uh, two questions here, but I will try to be brief and concise. 
so we'll start with care hosting and uh, explain what it means, uh, which is very briefly uh, communication strategies designed to demonstrate how caring a corporation is uh, in ways that are often obscure from the from that very corporation's actual destructive social and environmental impact. Um, for instance, I remember um, about a year ago, returning from a meeting with a care collective, and on my way back, uh, I stumbled upon a Primark Cares a pop-up store uh, near Sodit's Park. And it was the kind of store that could easily be mistaken for an ethical uh, beauty spa, with uh, all sorts of different candles, incenses, natural wood, etc. Um, and I went in out of curiosity, and I saw an in-store sign uh, saying, uh, and I quote here, uh, our Primark Cares initiative is our commitment to being a responsible retailer, taking care of our people and our planet, end quote. So now, um, having been someone who has studied and written about the use of exploitative labor in supply chains and modern slavery, uh, I was rather taken aback. I was like, how can a company that is so emblematic of fast fashion and our throwaway consumer society claim that it cares? Mm. So what is Interesting at the same time is that post-COVID, uh, during post-COVID, such campaigns proliferated. I actually started uh, keeping a record of them. And literally, platforms like Facebook and Instagram were saturated with uh, care worst messages by the good, the bad, and the ugly of the corporate world, from HSBC and Lloyds to Uber and Actimo. Uh, even Amazon, a corporation that was, uh, as I'm sure we, most of us know, was ordered, among others, to close its friends' factories on the basis of not respecting health and safety standards, uh, ran a campaign claiming the opposite. And I quote here, keeping our people safe while, while getting you the things you need has never been more important, end quote. So during basically a period of reduced mobility, social isolation and increasingly digitalized lives, we were constantly and persistently reminded that corporations care um, in ways that perhaps we should begin to suspect the very contrary. Um, we are aware, of course, I'm in a business school and, uh, you know, we are very aware that um, care hosting joins a very long history and genealogy of corporate talk around social and environmental issues, from corporate social responsibility statements to cause-related marketing initiatives such as Tom's One for One Shoes, uh, to charity credit cards and so on and so forth. Uh, perhaps the key difference, and that's why we like the term care hosting, is um, we, the observation that over the last two years, uh, corporations' engagement with the language of care has taken place in far more explicit terms, uh, mirroring perhaps, and that's what we argue, the realities of our now multiple uh, societal, environmental, and public health crises. So that's what care washing briefly means. Uh, but you also asked me on uh, what a caring economy, what a really caring economy would look like. Mm -hmm. um, so I will try to answer that very briefly. Um, and as we say in the manifesto, I would also say here, to begin with, we need to agree on what we mean by economy, caring or otherwise, uh, really caring or otherwise. And uh, we start by saying in the manifesto that we need to go beyond economies. Uh, we need to reimagine the economy as all that enables us to take uh, care uh, uh, of each other. Uh, economies are not just markets, consumers and producers, but also the material and immaterial care provisioned within our households, communities, states and the world at large. So this is a point we emphasize in our manifesto. And uh, in doing so, we uh, insist that the economic has to be reinvented within a society where care really is its organizing principle and universal care really is its um, underlying model. Um, we here, we follow the work of various uh, famous alternative socialist and progressive economists, such as yourself, Anne, uh, but also others such as Nancy Folber, Ryan, uh, Ryan Eisler, Kate Raworth, uh, Women's Budget Group, uh, to argue for a different economic vision, one that places economic activity uh, within a capacious understanding of capacity, uh, society and which is in turn understood as part of the ecology of the living world. And uh, we also join many of these uh, people in asserting that uh, care and capitalist market logics cannot be reconciled. Um, first, there are very few forms of care work that uh, are not best delivered with personal engagement and emotional attachment. And as we most of us already have realized uh, things like personal engagement and emotional attachment cannot be quantified or reduced to market metrics. Uh, second, uh, very briefly, markets, as we know, can only allocate care responsibilities and services on the basis of buying power. Um, given current income inequalities, this is clearly not good for universal care 
and social justice. And thirdly, uh, we also know that market norms are notorious for crowding out non-market norms. Uh, marketizing care uh, for grounds, self-interest and instrumentality in every sphere of our uncaring lives. Uh, think, for instance, a nanny working for care.com uh, that does anything the kids want with a view to uh, raise their ratings. Or a medical doctor working in private practice who is keen to process as many patients as possible and subscribe as many things as possible with a view to increase their daily targets. So. This is where we begin, and then we uh, outline uh, where we need to go from here, right? Um, and what we suggest is a two-pronged strategy uh, that addresses both, if you like, the marketization of care and the very nature of markets. Uh, first, uh, we need to demarketize and decommodify all our care infrastructures, enough with the reckless and destructive uh, marketization. Uh, for example, we could begin by resocializing and sourcing rather than outsourcing, as Joe just said, or as you say in your book, um, by bringing financial capital onshore rather than offshore, right? And of course, once we bring it offshore, we also have to make sure we effectively regulate it, uh, not least for reasons that those working in the largely privatized and financialized uh, care sector are well aware of. Uh, second, however, we also have to ponder the question whether markets can ever be caring. And a very straightforward answer to that is no, if what we mean by markets is markets driven by logics of capital accumulation. Uh, but clearly not all economic or marketplace activity is capitalist in that sense. Uh, we have to start building and recognizing already existing more caring, equitable and eco-socialist alternatives to capitalist markets. Uh, as Kate Raworth uh, puts it in her book, we need to re-regulate markets and such re-regulation and reconfiguration can take many forms from cooperatives to nationalization, progressive municipalism, localization, public commons partnerships, and so on. Through all these strategies, what is key is to ensure that consumers uh, are reconnected with producers and care receivers with caregivers. Uh, we have numerous examples of uh, such markets uh, from a small structure in Athens that I have studied previously and which directly linked Zapatista producers with Greek consumers uh, to the already scaled up solidarity economy structures of Spain, now accounting for roughly 10% of Spain's GDP. Uh, finally, as I said in the beginning, and I will try to conclude here, uh, much of the world's current economic activity remains invisible, largely because it doesn't register as economic, a point um, people like Gibson Graham have long made. Um, consider the welcoming and taking care of uh, refugees, for instance, as it happened in the various bottom-up uh, welcome centers in Greece uh, that I'm familiar with, but also throughout Europe. Um, places like City Plaza, a squatted hotel in the center of Athens, uh, proceeded through collective cooking initiatives, cert cleaning uh, main and maintenance rotas, uh, participation in gifting and solidarity bazaars, and so on. Uh, what such practices had in common was their embracement of anti- and non-capitalist values of collaboration, sharing, mutuality and co-production. Uh, the squad, in other words, was not simply about providing care to refugees, but rather it was about the development of equal and reciprocal relationships within what we could describe as an informal economy that defied both logics of banal carelessness and logics of capital. That would stop there. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, thank you to all of you. That's been really inspiring and made me very envious of your the sessions you must have had together. I wish I'd been a fly on the wall. They must have been intellectually so very interesting. So thank you for that. And while I'm here, can I just welcome our visitors, our, our viewers? I see we have someone here from Lisbon, from um, Manhattan. So we've got a wide variety of people and, and they're all welcome mm. and very really pleased to see them here. I want to just make three points. And one, and they, to, they really are sort of to do with the Green New Deal in a sense. What was so striking about the lockdown and COVID was that we realized for the first time that we, the people, the workers, make the economy, essentially. And some of the most important players in that were health workers, were carers. Um, you know, footballers had no role to play what, at whatever. Um, Billionaires on the whole were entirely irrelevant. The state, the collective effort of the state was what was needed. But it was the concept of the fact that 
ordinary people made the economy that was so powerful to me. You know, they they cared for us when we were ill, they and saved our lives. You know, you know, they, our survival was dependent on them, but so was our survival dependent on truck drivers and shelf stackers in supermarkets and people that carried on producing food. All of these people are low paid, undervalued, as you argue in your book, um, and, and, de and commodified. But actually, they are actually the most valuable part of the economy. They are the, without them, there would be no economy. And I just feel that we have to gain the confidence of that knowledge and that understanding um, in order to understand our power over the economy. So I wanted to say that. The other thing is that care worker, care working is a service. And as such, it will be fundamental to a Green New Deal. Because the point about services is that they're not as greenhouse gas emitting. They're not as invasive. They are not as extractive as most other sectors of the economy. Mm -hmm. And so they are going to have to become a much bigger part of the economy. And my final point is this. You know, what we should be cheered up by your strategy and by your, your thinking that you've done for us in order for us to develop strategies further and to campaign. And thank you for that gift. Um, is that we've done this before. We can do it again. Of course, it took a catastrophic world war for us to set up the National Health Service and the beverage report and so on. But we know we could do it and we did do it and we did it to a capitalist economy. So we should take heart from that. I particularly take heart from the 1933 Roosevelt administration, which transformed the global economy, not just the American economy, and and provided essential services like restoring the soil, basically, um, and needed to restore um, environmental stability. So I've said quite enough, but I just so much value what your contributions tonight and this book. So thank you so much for it. So are there any other general questions? I've had some questions here. Um, and uh, they led largely to do with um, why does it take such a large crisis for the notion of care and interdependence to finally become urgent? Why do you think that's so? What is it? Is it... Uh, Andreas is going to tell us it's because of the capital of capitalism, but but does anyone want to answer that question from a viewer? Lynn, yeah, uh, yeah. Well, it is strange, isn't it? Because the crisis of care so long predated COVID. In fact, we were meeting and writing about this very big crisis of care several years before COVID came along. I think that some people were aware of it, actually. There was more talk about care. Care was coming up people's agenda, but it really came to the fore everywhere with COVID. It just as though we had to have a disaster, a catastrophe to stop us in our tracks. And we were stopped in our tracks, weren't we? We could, couldn't go to our everyday jobs and so on. And then, as you say, Mutual aid took off and we started caring for each other. The big danger now, particularly when COVID is so much back again, is are mm. we going to be able to maintain this? And um, mm. the crisis bring things out and then, then people get tired and unsure about it. So I think mm. people are aware of it, but you know we need time and resources to deal with it. And that's what we've got to just keep on pushing for, you know, whether it's through the Labour Party, through our community organisations, through our jobs, just keep pushing for more time and resources to care. Well, that brings me to this question, a question for Joe. I mean, what do you think the opportunities are around what's happening now um, for, um, for care, for, for making the ideas in your book a reality? Oh, tough one. Um, well, I guess connected to the pandemic again, you, you see a, a burgeoning of uh, smaller scale, in particular, initiatives around mutual aid that are really flourishing and show people's creativity and ability to um, act in an interdependent and sustainable way. But then you, at the same time, um, uh, and we have, we do have kind of encouraging and heartening national responses, which kind of hint at 
um, what the state can do. You know, mm -hmm. Spain. I, I mentioned Spain taking its private hospitals back into public sector as as one good example of that. And you know, there's initiatives in Germany that are similar. So there, are, on the one hand, we have we have those kind of um, embryonic creative projects and. Um, the resurgence of the idea that yeah. the state can provide, which was, you know, apparently unthinkable. There wasn't yeah. the magic money tree has been rediscovered in many ways. But then we also have um, the in intensification of, of neoliberal disaster capitalism and the kind of the cronyism of the oligarchs taking that money and siphoning it off for personal gain, um, which needs to be more publicised. Um, because obviously they own a lot of the media as well, our offshore billionaires. Um, so it's 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 a it's a multifaceted you know field, isn't it? It's it's a, there's problems and there's opportunities at the same time. So thank you for that, Joe. But Catherine, perhaps you could say something to enlarge on the point that Lynn made about um, the refusal of men to acknowledge their vulnerability, their dependency. How do we do this at at our you know at our at the level of the home and at the level of the family and at the level of the community? Sort of understand that yeah, that, <laughs> understand that, that dependency is a is a natural thing. It's something we shouldn't be afraid of. Well, I think I'm going to touch on that question by sort of going back to some of the earlier questions, because I think that what's happened with COVID um, is, in fact, a rupture. And I think that there's a way in which common sense has suddenly become less common sense and that sort of norms and going about our everyday lives suddenly became impossible. And I think that what happened at that moment was a real rupture where many of the old rules no longer seem to apply. So all of a sudden the new norm is wearing masks in public spaces, right? Which is, if you think about February or thinking about their, the possibility of lockdown, it was just not something on our horizon, right? So I think that what's happened now in terms of um, questions of care and interdependency is that COVID has been, has exposed it in particular ways. And of course, we've seen that on the one hand, um, women have taken up as always in these kinds of crises, there's been um, a intensification of the gender division of labor in households. But on the other hand, in terms of care and the, and the and the valuing of care, we've seen a shift in which you know large swaths of the population are now taking up this conversation about care. And I find that hopeful to a certain extent. And then echoing what um, Joe said, I think that we are at a crossroads on so many levels, and we can go in various directions now. We can either um, sort of build um, on the kinds of uh, sort of um, mutual aid and spontaneous uh, er eruptions of mutual aid and other kinds of grassroots organizations where care is central and build a more enduring sort of uh, world in which care is uh, front and center. Or um, we could see, you know, things getting worse and really um, moving toward uh, yet more disaster capitalism. So in terms of how we move forward, I think that we need to insist on maintaining this conversation around care and vulnerability and interdependency going forward. And so that would be um, one of the ways in which we can begin sort of countering the, the insistence on autonomy Thank and you. neoliberal um, norms. I'd like to then turn to Jamie, um, because Jamie, I was very struck by your um analogy or the way you brought out the um, HIV AIDS uh, campaign and the loving, the loving care that went into that campaigning and those kinships. And the thing about the HIV the campaigns like ACT UP and so on was the fact that that kinship extended well beyond borders, well beyond the communities of uh, gay communities, but well beyond gay communities in the United States in the first instance, and then internationally. Can you talk more about those kinships? Um, yeah, I mean, and, and of course, it's I think very important to say that um, that the AIDS is uh, there is still an HIV crisis globally. I mean, of course. There, are, there are many kind of you know advances in in the West and in America and the UK that have 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 slowed it down. 
um, but kind of globally that still exists. And I mean, I can't necessarily speak about historically those kind of connections, but yeah, I mean, one of the kind of principles, I guess, of promiscuous care is, is precisely to model itself on that capacious sense of who you care for. Um, because obviously it's important to say that during the AIDS crisis, often biological families didn't, they rejected um, kind of uh, LGBT, uh, the LGBT children, and they couldn't necessarily go back to them to ask for the care that kind of, you know, a Reaganite uh, model of care wanted. And, um, and so, yeah, so I think that kind of stretching outwards of, uh, some type uh, of who you care for you know we we go right across the spectrum in the book um so not only to kind of strangers across the globe uh mm. about people in war zones and people thinking about um uh, refugees and so on and migrants but also thinking about um using indigenous indigenous knowledges um to stretch that idea of kinship even to um uh, even to the non-human world. And we refer to, I think it's a verse book as well by Nick Estes that um, looks at various kind of indigenous struggles in America and uses the kind of indigenous American understanding of the non-human world as family. Um, yeah, and, and so I, th I think, and you're right to absolutely bring that up. It wasn't just simply about people in New York or people in Chicago or even people in London. It mm -hmm. was care is, a, is about... Uh, kind of, as I say, multiplying and experimenting and stretching as widely as possible the things we're supposed to naturally feel, as uh, that we're told we're supposed to naturally feel as, as family and beginning to imagine that um, in a much more kind of global and more capacious sense. Lovely. Um, so I have a, a comment here. These are not questions so much from Elsie Bryant, who says that mutual aid has a long history in black and migrant and uh, marginalized communities. It's not new. And um, and then, you know, I think we can agree with you on that, uh, uh, Elsie. Um, then I have a um, I have a comment from Liz Yates, who says she's writing her undergraduate dissertation on people's motivations for engaging in mutual aid and the meanings they attach to that involvement. And so your book, she says, is very useful and relevant. Thanks so much for writing it. I think we can all join in that. And um, we've not got much time left. I, I wanted to make one more point, which, which I think is a mild criticism of the book, that from my perspective, which is that you're not really discussing the economics of this. And it seems to me, uh, perhaps in a very broad sense, but one of the things that's striking is about how we are so determined to pay carers so little, really, and, and, and to provide them with very little training and very little, if you like, upgrading of their work. And that is damaging to the economy. One of the things that we're arguing uh, in the Women's Budget Group is that the the pay of of skilled carers has to be raised it has to be raised um because you know it doesn't currently reflect reflect the degree of skill and the degree of effort involved in care i mean you'll know much more about it than i do but for me it's this low pay which is so so obscene really given the value of that of that work you know to our survival but also there's a broader economic point is that if we lifted the the pay and and the skills of carers if we had higher paid more skilled so uh higher paid and better skilled carers that would help to balance the public finances one of the reasons the public finances are out of kilt is that um so so many people are in precarious jobs, low pay, temporary jobs, which actually don't pay enough tax. And as a result, the public finances are unbalanced. And it's not an accident. If you cut spending on these essential services, if you cut pay, uh, you'll, you'll uh, if you like, inhibit the state's ability to collect enough tax revenues to balance the books. So from a sort of macroeconomic perspective, improving the degree of caring and, the, and valuing caring far more than we do is important to the macro economy, is what I wanted to say, because that's my patch. <laughs> anyway, can I just finish by saying that this has been 
wildly stimulating and interesting and intellectually satisfying. So can I thank all the members of the collective because uh, it's and, and Verso for giving us this opportunity. Thank you. And thank, thank you, you, Anne. Uh, thank you. We don't disagree with the last point. Next week, Anne, we should perhaps mention the Women's Budget Group is bringing a report out next week, and that's going to be very useful to the question, yes. the crucial question of raising carers' wages and recognizing their skills. If you think of Ken Loach's film, Sorry We Missed You, it comes yeah. out very well there. Carers are not given the time to care, and um, that's just yeah. something that has to be rectified. Yeah, no, so I'm a member of the Women's Budget Group, and we're issuing this report, which we hope will have a big impact on the economy and on debate. So um, thank you very much to the Care Collective for your book. And can I encourage everybody watching to go out and buy it? It's really good for, for the brain. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers. Good night. Thank you, Anne.